good Wednesday morning. I am hitting the record button because John and I have now been talking for 10 minutes and I was just thinking you guys would like to talk about it. We're going to talk about some other things, uh, but as him and I talk, I think you guys would enjoy maybe listening into the conversation. John was just asking me how church was and then we got into a book about John Webster and now we're just talking about the state of the church and what it might look like in the next coming years. Well, the way the way I, it comes up in my mind is I've been thinking for some time about the nature of the church. It's clearly going to change after COVID. We failed in so many ways, particularly we failed to insist that a Christian way of dying cannot be usurped by an epi- epidemiologist looking at data in a foreign laboratory. That's like straightforwardly stupid and we're going to learn from that lesson what we've done to a generation of children uh well a part of partial generation we're going to live with and they're going to live with for life because there are critical learning periods in those first few years of life and not be able to see the lips of your teacher does it surprise you that uh, skills in reading and comprehension and the like are way behind normal of course it doesn't so Webster's been very good for me because he distills brilliantly in his book, uh, Confronted by Grace, which is a series of homilies, really. That, and so for people who think they're busy, at least every now and again you can stop and read half a dozen pages, which is all he usually needs, or perhaps a little bit more than that, for each homily. And it, it absolutely stuffed with material. Uh, and ways of thinking about yourself and your church. So uh, at Augustine College, uh, once a month, one of us will talk about a a book for the benefit of everybody else and explain why it's been important to us. And my turn came around uh, just a week or so back, uh, and I talked about John Webster's uh, Confronted by Grace. Uh, now, what we do is we send a section from the book we're going to talk about, if we want to, for everybody to look at. I sent the first uh, homily in the book, seven pages. And I knew with my first question uh, that I had hit a gold mine because I asked the first question, did that little taste of John Webster make any difference to any of you? Did it stop you in your tracks? And one of my colleagues, Nancy, held up the book and the whole book was stuffed with little taps, tapes. She said, i have never done this on this scale to a book before. She said, I do it normally, but I'm not, I've got no other book like this. You could sweep the floor with the taps that were coming out of the book. Um, and what he does in that first section I, first of all, hadn't put the parable of the wicked husbandman contextually and chronologically into our Lord's life on earth, but uh, it's placed in the Gospels on the last journey to Jerusalem. And uh, one of the things that is said about it is that the Pharisees perceived that he was talking about them. And what he's doing in the in the the wicked husband, and we, we like to distance ourselves and think, well, the Pharisees were pretty hypocritical people. But John Webster brilliantly shows us we are just as guilty as they are and of the same sin. Uh, we domesticate or we try to domesticate Christ, and in the process, we take away all the power. Because as he says in the parable of the vine, you can do nothing without me. Now, he's not saying you. Uh, at first sight, yeah, sure, everything ultimately comes from you, but it's much more personal than that. Uh, and what John Webster points out about the wicked husband and is they were very modern in many ways. He doesn't say that. I mean, this was written 25 years ago. But he saw today coming, prophetically, if you like. Uh, he says what that, what that story is about and what all the activity of Passion Week is about is the fact that all the main characters and us are guilty of lying about the truth. We refuse to acknowledge it at the level that wouldn't rationally happen if we stopped to think about it. It is the greatest story ever told. 
the events of that short period in history totally transform the history of the world, and we try to domesticate it. We have no sense of awe when we enter God's presence in the church. We arrive usually to sing happy, clappy songs in evangelical churches or in the Catholic ones to go through a ritual that saves us thinking too much about how important it might be if we don't want to do that, which is most of us most of the time. So both ends of the, uh, the Christian spectrum have a similar sort of problem that we have domesticated uh, the story so that he doesn't carry the punch to each of us as an individual that it should. And what is the lie? Well, the big lie is the failure to acknowledge that the man Jesus was also God. And what he did, therefore, has immense importance for us, primarily uh, for our salvation. But our salvation is not just a change of relationship. Uh, in the way that we want to. Oh, yes, I was converted on such and such a day. I, I signed the pledge. I'm a Christian. Uh, that's the beginning. That's, stopping there is, as I usually say, like leaving a sports event when they've sung the national anthem and not bothering with the event. That's what most Christians do. So church is all built around us, not around him. Uh, one of my tests for the the periodic new songs we have in church is what I call the I-thou ratio. I will look through it very quickly and see if the I's dominate the thou's, so to speak. And thou, in a sense, is better than you because it's God we're talking about. If the you is just another human being, that's not what I'm talking about. That's why the Psalms are so great, that they do focus in the right place. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. We don't even behave as though we need a rock and salvation. We just want to feel better about it. We're a feel-better society, and that's not what church is about, because church starts with feeling bad about ourselves, because that's the truth. The first beatitude, the first blessedness, the first step to real happiness is to discover that you are a sinner, but there is a saviour. But the relationship with our Saviour is utterly dependent upon the practice of confession. Uh, I use the story often because I think it, it, it captures something very important in a memorable and very brief way. Uh, I've got name block at the moment for the Archbishop of Canterbury, whose name was Michael. He was back two or three. He was very known to be... a a laconic sort of man. He he didn't waste words. And just after he was elevated to Archbishop of Canterbury, a rather pert young American uh, a journalist uh, got an interview with him and it was very plain that she wanted to embarrass him in some way. And uh, he was up to the task, of course. Uh, so she congratulated him on becoming uh, Archbishop of Canterbury and then said, Archbishop, have you said your prayers today? To which he responded, yes. Uh, and she thought about it. And she said, how long did you pray for? About one minute. That's not very long, Archbishop, is it? No, but it took me 30 minutes to get there what John Stock calls the battle of the threshold that most of us, most of the time, don't even engage in. God is always present, but we can only enter into his presence if we have confessed our sins in a real sense. It's the entry ticket, if you like. It cannot be otherwise. God is pure holiness. If we were to enter into his presence, Unforgiven, unshriven, as Shakespeare puts it in the, before the Battle of Agincourt or in Henry V. Unconfessed, uncleansed, we would be wiped out. He maintains a safe distance for us because we have no idea about what a safe distance is. But when it happens, big things happen. I mean, Jonathan Edwards, who was the 
the trigger for the 18th century revival in uh, North America gives an account somewhere of riding out on his horse uh, into the country and then getting off and being absolutely, as many would say now, slain in the spirit, devastated by just how sinful he was and how much grace he had received. Uh, he knew what the Battle of the Threshold was about and he went through it, which is why he was used so mightily. And he was not an interesting speaker. He wasn't a master of rhetoric, which is what all politicians are now, Obama par excellence, uh, rhetoric without content. He was about being a servant of the Lord. And I don't think that comes into uh, description because, oh, it's so demeaning. Uh, Paul actually says that Christ chose to become a servant, a slave, to show us the way forward. Now, church has got to come alive at that kind of level again, and I think uh, repentance has got to be the major feature, and it's got to start with the church. Otherwise, we will not be any fit state to do anything. And it's not easy, is it? It's far more than saying I'm a sinner. It's learning to realize that that is the starting point, and it's actually a very blessed one, because from then on, because that's the combination of the first and the second beatitude, uh, seeing the truth and then being given the gift of repentance. We can't repent at will. We wish to be in charge of everything. That's what John Webster is saying in that first sermon. We want to domesticate. We want to be the central controller of what's going on. Uh, our churches, modern churches, are designed in that way. I mean, the difference between the great medieval uh, uh, cathedrals is that when you enter through the doorway, two things happen to you, and you can't stop yourself doing it. The first is you lower your voice, and the second is you raise your eyes. Now, when we get to the church on Sunday morning, our churches are now designed so that we don't look upwards, we look laterally. It's made easy for us so that we can see what everybody's doing, work, chatting to who you want to chat to. We are the center of the, the whole process. And that's not going to take us anywhere. So John Webster does that for me in a big way. And obviously that evening, I, I, I didn't do what I usually do. I actually read the first sermon, which it only takes, what, 10 minutes or so to read, 10 to 15 minutes. And then we talk from there. That's not supposed to be the way uh, you do a book review, but I didn't do it the way you're supposed to do it because, well, my heart wasn't in it that way. And it was good. The, the evening was good. So does that challenge you a little bit? When you, The fact that a lot of people are talking about church is good. Uh, but expect the outcome to be real repentance and then division because you're saying to other people when it happens to you you become a challenge don't expect to be loved for it so the last beatitude is the only one that's repeated blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you for my name's sake rejoice that's real Christian rejoicing it's not induced by happy, clappy music. Jesus says, here you are being persecuted for my name's sake in one way or another. It can be big, it can be small, it doesn't matter. Uh, he commands you to rejoice. So it cannot be a feeling. And he goes on and he gives you two reasons for your, for your rejoicing. Not two feelings, but two reasons. They did the same to the prophets. That's good company. And you have a reward in heaven. That's good banking. Solid, unshakable reasons for rejoicing, which is why the early martyrs were famous for the fact that when they died, the presence of Christ had become so real. Stephen didn't feel the stones. He was looking at Christ. And that phenomenon went round the Christian world and it was repeated time and time again in those first and some very bad periods of time when 
thousands of Christians were martyred. It didn't matter to them at the end. Uh, yeah, sure, that nobody looked forward to it, but Christ made the promise, have no fear, I will be with you. And they saw that that was true. And the, the Roman authorities had no answer to that. The, 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 the Colosseum where two men fought till one had killed the other for entertainment of everyone else, that stopped because a monk uh, in his devotions became aware that God was telling him to go to Rome. So he went. He didn't know why. Uh, when he got there, Rome was pretty silent because everybody was in the Colosseum. So he went and he saw that what was happening is that two men were fighting to the death for the pleasure of everybody else to watch him be killed, one of them be killed. And he knew this was wrong. So he jumped into the Colosseum and went and stood between the two gladiators. Uh, one looked up to the emperor to see whether he got a thumbs up or a thumbs down. He got a thumbs down, so off came the head of the monk. And then the whole Colosseum went silent. And the emperor and his wife left, and so did everyone else. And men did not fight to the death again in the Colosseum. We don't have that. Well, there are examples, you meet them every now and again. But everybody who has put their faith on the line a little bit has realized you're not alone. And that's, that's beyond the price of rubies. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. The book that John was talking about was Confronted by Grace and who's set by John Webster. Uh, it's a book I just got in the mail last night and started reading and maybe you guys might enjoy it too. With that being said, we'll see you guys in next week's podcast.